And I also made sure that every song had um, like different sections because um, kind of like the it, it, it's similar to like my idea of uh, the cannibal music is that um, I think these days there's 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 way too much overemphasis on interactive music. And what I mean by that is that like people game designers think that they should innovate with music by saying, okay, I'm gonna write programming that says, will you do this very specific action, this cute place, and just, just overthinking it to the point where it's just like, it just, it's, you know, I was talking to, uh, is Jimmy here? I was talking to Jimmy about this, about like with Mass Effect 2 and how like, and he agreed because they, they had to write like 140, 160 cues or something. It was just like every little tiny event they could think of was like, oh, Sh Shepard, you know, moves his left elbow and we'll play this one. F sharp. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, they, they're, they're trying to like, kind of like, um, kind of like how like you know, the, the, the difference between like there's a score in a movie and like, what, what, and, and a score in a cartoon. So like when you watch a Mickey Mouse cartoon, there's actually a term called Mickey Mousing. When you write the music, every single action on screen has a hit, like or, or a xylophone or, or something, whatever. And it's just it's it's excessive, and I think it's 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 they're they're just impeding on um, on trusting musicians to know what game music is supposed to sound like. And um, basically, what I'm trying to say is that like in Cannibal, um, what I wanted to do is write a track that was like. You know in Cannibal when you, you run across the roof and there's doves and they fly away? Well there's this really cool sound effect that Adam made of just doves flying away. And I thought it was I thought it was just like beautiful in the context context of this city being destroyed and like, oh, in the midst of all this there is this like peaceful moment where doves are flying away. And it was very like John Woo too, you know, and and like my like and as weird as it sounds, my primary motivation in writing the music for Cannibal was to write something that would be like action packed and like get people into it, but also have um, a time in the music where like the music would come down, be ambient or whatever, and you would hear that sound effect. And so you don't have to deliberately make music interactive um, through programming. You can just write music that's conducive to being interactive. Does that does that make sense? Like like. And because like I, I just had this idea in my head that like oh you would have this crazy track and everything would be going crazy shit's blowing up and then you it comes down and you hear the doves flying away and it just and, it, and, it, and then I played the game and it happened and I was so satisfied I'm like I'm so glad that happened and it's the same kind of idea with with the Super Meat Boy it may not be the same with, with every game but it's like um, I, I try to write music so that the things you're doing in the gameplay make sense you know what I mean like like um, and it's really hard because it's very abstract to say, okay, I'm a piece of meat jumping around saws, but, you know, like in the hospital, it just, it's... Are you dinner? It was... Whatever. <laughs> I, Thanks, I get long-winded, I'm sorry, but that, that's what I'm trying to say, is like, it's just, just, it's important for the music to serve the gameplay, because that's what it is there for. Um, I agree to the extent that in games like the Rainbow, where you've got basically one level of gameplay. You don't have, like, everything is universal, it's either a wall or it kills you. And in that way, it, there's no different, there's no meta level or anything like that, so one track work. But in a game, like, the, the farthest example on the other end of the spectrum would be a rhythm game, in which you want the gameplay to be depending on the music and vice versa. Um, and somewhere in between, I think it's a, uh, I, I might in some cases add track layers, but I, mean, I wouldn't like more for the entire music. It's like, um, it, it varies based on the situation, but it's, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Alright, we're gonna, um, what I want to do is, everybody should know this song I'm about to play. If you don't know, please stand up and leave. <laughs> Obviously this is a cave story. Um, this this is a testament to the talent that one individual can have for story writing, programming, being an extremely talented artist, and you know, top of the cherry on top, put us out of work and do his own fucking music. So jerk off. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, also, one of, the, one of the things that's amazing about Cave Story, it's not like this specific track, but just the fact that he made his own engine for it. Oh, exactly. And then, like, I mean, who here knows George and Jonathan? Does anybody here know them? You should. You should, you should know them. You should know them. They're excellent, excellent chiptune guys out of Philadelphia. 
Um, and they have, they have several free albums out. One of them's called The Best Music. The other one's like Christmas, Best Christmas or something like that. And they do all their stuff with the tools that um, were created, you know, that Pixel created for Cave Story. These are amazing they, tunes. Amazing know. tools. David's gone. Yeah. I've, I've, I've used these tools myself. And the way they work is, I mean, uh, how many here are like composers using, you know, I don't know, Cubase, Logic, whatever? Um, well, if you know, if you know like sequencers, you know the, 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 the piano roll view where you got like the piano keys, black and white keys on one side of the screen and you've got like a spreadsheet where you just jot in like boxes and that's, that's, those are the uh, notes that you're going to play. And PX Tone is basically about you create your waveforms and then you import them into like the se very simplified sequencer where every track is like a monophonic track and basically it'll, it gives you a lot of limitation but in essence it liberates you because I mean be, having limitations liberates you in you know what can I do with this I only I can only do this but what can I do with that instead of being able to do anything and you're like what the hell am I gonna do you get you got you can do either this this or this what am I gonna do with that I think that's also kind of why I'm, that's also kind of why I'm not comfortable like when people um, give me credit for being like a chip tune artist because I'm not like chip tunery is a um, it, it's like a very specific and, 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 and distinct skill in that you have to deal with limited polyphony. Exactly. You have to deal with all these all these things and like I just use samples and make shit sure that, that sounds old. You know? Yeah, I'm, pretty, I'm like, pretty sure that Albatross is gonna come kick your ass if he hears you say that you're a chip tune artist, which you've never said. No, before. yeah, no. Which is the whole point. Can we register well, that domain chip tunery? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I think that would be successful. That. I'm a trendsetter. I mean, English as, is a living language. As a composer myself, I feel that having those limitations, I, I come from tracking, and it's just having limitations is an inspiring challenge. And I think that's one of the appeals of being a chiptune artist or doing tracking or mod plug or any of that sort of thing. I mean, you don't, you don't have to be like hardcore chiptune, stay to like, like three channels and like uh, percussion or something. I mean, there's more to music sounding old school than that's just yeah. that. You can use other things like. Uh, arpeggios, stuff like that, because you couldn't play chords, you couldn't play like several tones at the same time. So use the arpeggio technique, but you can use it and abuse it, so it's familiar, but still new and it's still fresh. You can just play around with it. Play around with it. I'm just going to ask with the limitations that you create for yourself. I mean, obviously when you're writing games and they're just like, okay, your game is a platform and you're running around with ball meat. I mean, what kind of limitations are you going to give yourself to write music that's fitting for that? Well, let me, well I'll say something real quick. Just um, not, not, not to pimp Eternal Robots too much, but it, it's a good example because for that game, um, there's an earlier indie soundtrack that I did for a, uh, it's a twin stick shooter, Fittest. Um, and, you know, you play Geometry Wars, stuff like that. It's basically that kind of thing. Thank you. Um, and, you know, with that, I kind of just did a whole range of styles because the graphic style changed and there wasn't really anything, you know, cohesive. But with Return of Robots, it's like, if, if there aren't necessarily external limitations, and it's just sort of, there's no really specific thing that you're doing. There are a lot of different levels. I, I decided from the beginning, all right, I'm going to make this 80s. It's going to be 80s. I'm going to use, like, all 80s drums, 80s synths. It's got to sound like, you know, a little bit of cheese in there. Um, yeah, delicious, I know. Um, but the, yeah, I think, I mean, there's like kind of self-imposed limitations that, you know, I, had, I set, and you gotta keep that discipline. I don't know if you've experienced that too, you know, anybody else here, but... Um, I mean, yeah, I think what you're talking about is just like choosing an aesthetic for the game, and that can be a limitation too. Like a lot of times, if I'm, it's, um, and even uh, one of my hugest, one of my biggest uh, influences in, uh, is Prodigy, Liam Hallett, and um, he, uh, he actually, uh, he was talking once about how he started using Reason because he was so sick of having, he wanted to introduce some kind of, stop it, I'm not your meat, um, um, of like having too much like equipment and stuff and, and, and being in a, in a rut or whatever. And like a lot of times, because you know, I have, at this point I've just amassed like so many samples and so many VSTs and everything to, to, to do all these things. And like a lot of times if I'm just like having a hard time, I will just put like three subtractors in Reason, which a subtractor is a very simple um, analog synth, just like an old school tubey kind of thing, and just try to write something interesting with three identical voices. Um, and just, you know, that way, because then what I can do is I can say, okay, I have a, a cool melody bass line and, and, and harmony, and then, then worry about making it sound good and better, because the, the, I, I think, 
absolutely the um, entire composition should be led by the quality of like the melody and the harmony and not the quality of the sounds. I think that's a mistake a, a lot of, and I think it's going that way a lot is like a lot of music is just, you know, hold down a button in atmosphere for two minutes and that's your cue because... This is the second time we brought that up. I, it's, it's the second. Yeah, it's... Third. Third. Yeah. Fourth. <laughs> one of the other ones too. Was, uh, oh. There's lots of things I think too that can make something sound retro without needing to, like David said, it doesn't have to be, you know, a three channel thing. And I, I, I could never do that, probably. Um, I wrote a soundtrack that I tried to make sound retro, one of the first things I did. And I just threw it like orchestra samples in the middle of it. And I still think it gets the vibe across. Such an asshole. So, like, this is gonna have like trumpets and stuff in the middle of those arpeggios that David was describing. Like, you definitely don't have to be one of those hardcore four channel people, but it doesn't hurt to do that if you're going for that vibe. One of the things that Retro City Rampage does, which is a, one of the uh, IGF nominees in the Excellence in Audio category this year, is it stays very true to um, being chiptunes, Vert, Jake Kaufman, um, and two other very talented artists uh, put that together, and it, it, it got them somewhere, and it also it adds so much to the game. Has anybody played Retro City Rampage? No, do you know of it? At least it's good. Shut up, Anthony. Hi. <laughs> Hello. It's basically every NES game combined. It, yeah, yes, no, it's, it's amazing. Really it's got so many references. It's almost like a little baby version wait, of Super Meat Boy. So you're saying it has ET in it? I, uh, it, it may have an ET reference. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I wouldn't probably. be surprised. <laughs> um, I, I want to shift gears here, and this is kind of a... Because since we're talking about... Um, it's so obviously just music that where they hold chords and do atmospheres. There are many artists who can do the atmospheric stuff without going over the top. And I actually have, has anybody played Minecraft? I have some exclusive music from Minecraft that I'm going to play that he gave me for this. So I love Dead Mouse. Oh my god, right? <laughs> so, okay, the issue there is, is my, the guy who does Minecraft was approached by Dead Mouse. and said, I love your game, can I do some music? And, um... So the original artists it kind of got pushed out of the limelight a little, which is which is a fucking tragedy because C four one eight is amazing. Yes, so it's it's kind of devastating. Um, so I'm just gonna play some of that and we can make fun of it while he's not here and it's an AUG, so it's not gonna play up. He's German. He wouldn't understand us anyway. Yeah, he's kind of emo looking too. <laughs> Bash. Yeah. By the way, if you ever want to just like talk to the guy that you know C C four eighteen, the guy that did most of Minecraft's music, he's just like on IRC. You just like go and talk to him many times. Just hangs out online all day. Just at C4 all day. Day. Yeah, I mean, he's very approachable, so if you ever want to talk Isn't to him. Is he like 12? I know, I don't think he's 12, but maybe 16. I think this does a really good job of being one of those games that has atmospheric music. There's lots of personality here, there's lots of depth, but it's more than one chord. But it fits Minecraft like a glove. Yeah. Like, and what's on the forefront of my mind every time I hear any kind of game music is how is it serving the gameplay. If you've played Minecraft, it's beautiful and terrifying and all these strange new emotions that I never knew a game could, could give me and it, it just fits so perfectly. Boner, I get a boner too. <laughs> and there's giggles so I gotta throw something. Gotta throw out a boner. Minecraft boner. 